Today, we are very pleased to have uh, Trudy Forte, who's a senior scientist in the Labs Life Sciences Division and a staff scientist at the Children's Hospital of Oakland Research Institute. Uh, she will discuss her work developing nano-sized lipoprotein particles that can be used as a safe and effective means of delivering anti-cancer drugs to uh, brain tumors, and particularly glioblastoma multiform. Uh, this is the uh, most malignant uh, brain tumor in adults and also one of the deadliest forms of cancer overall. Her research team has found that the synthetic LDL particles can target and kill such tumor cells in vitro. So this is a very promising uh, research. Trudy has been with Berkeley Lab for about 35 years and with Children's Hospital of Oakland Research Institute for three years. She received her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a fellow of the American Heart Association Council on Arterial Sclerosis and a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Association for Cancer Research. She was the previous editor and chief for the Journal of Lipid Research and was the recipient of the Association of University Women DOE Distinguished Lectureship and of the Special Recognition Award of the American Heart Association Council on Arterial Sclerosis thrombosis, and vascul vascular biology. Her lecture today is about 40 to 50 minutes, and afterwards we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions. Please wait for a uh, microphone so everybody can hear you uh, before you ask your question. And I think we have to uh, leave uh, the auditorium at a, probably at about 1 o'clock, so we'll have to wrap up sh uh, promptly at 1 o'clock. Please join me in welcoming Trudy Forte. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and it's good to be back here. I think the last time I gave a talk, it was for women in particular, it was cardiovascular disease in women. And I guess what I'm talking about today is, is a giant step in, in another direction. I'm going to be talking about tumor cells. And I think that's what's fascinating about science, for those of you who are just starting in it. You can start in one field, and what it teaches you, you can translate it into another field. So what I know about lipoproteins has been very useful in trying to um, direct drugs to tumors, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's kind of a, a very stimulating time right now in the cancer field because people are talking about personalized medicine. In other words, if you have a particular tumor, they want to find out more about it. Do you have a specific protein on that tumor surface? You can make an antibody for it. Uh, can you make vaccines to these tumor cells? The other way is to find a particular receptor which is on these cells, and mainly just on the tumor cell, and that receptor would be internalized. And so what you would like to do then is to um, get the little key that fits into the lock, which is the receptor, and hook onto it in some way a drug, and then have that drug be pulled into the cell. And that's the area, actually, that I'm working on. So we call it target delivery of drugs to cancer cells. Now, what I call these particles are stealth particles, which are targeted for delivery of drugs to brain tumors. And in other words, that the particle would not be recognized by the cell as something bad. And so it would take it up, and inside the particle there would be all these drugs which would unload into the cell and kill the cell. And I'm interested in glioma cells because, um, as Dan mentioned, this is a, a terrible tumor in the brain. And most of these cells arise from what are known as the glial cells. So these are neuroepithelial cells in the brain, and they are really support cells for the neurons in the brain. And it turns out the glial cells represent 70 to 80 percent of the total cells in the brain. Now, the glial cells, there are several flavors of them. They're the astrocytes, the oligodendroglial cells, and the ependymal cells. And the ependymal cells really line the ventricles. Now, the gliomas, when they become tumors, they grow very aggressively. And in particular, you get the grade 4 gliomas, which are known as the glioblastoma multiform, here, or GBM. Now, these have multiple genetic and chromosomal abnormalities and often will have more than one type of glial cell associated with the tumor. Now, how do you treat 
this particular tumor. By the way, this tumor is found mainly in adults uh, between the ages of 40, past that 40 to 60, this will often crop up. And the main way of dealing with it is to use surgery, uh, followed by radiation and or chemotherapy. But no matter what you do, within a year, that person is no longer with us. So it's a very devastating tumor when you have that tumor and or have someone in the family who has a tumor to deal with this. So it was about um, 10 years ago, just to give you some of the background on how I got into this, that the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory was interested in making what was called a born nutrient capture therapy. Uh, way of delivering therapy to the tumors and then using the neutron beam to bombard the particles. And what they were using was boron, which would be pulled into the cell. And then with the neutron beam hitting this boron atom, you would release the high energy particles, which then would cause oxidations in the cell and would kill the cell. Now this assumes, of course, that one is able to get the boron particles into the cells. And Ellie Blakely, who is here, was working with somebody of UC San Francisco, Steve Kale, and he was able to get uh, protoporphyrin and bind onto it a cluster of boronated uh, atoms. Okay. And so this is how I got involved because when Ellie was working with this, she got very excited and she showed me some pictures. And what she had done, you can see this red here. Porphyrins have, they fluoresce on, this, on themselves, and they are red fluorescent. So what you see is these cells have taken up this red material, which is really the por porphyrins. And with it is taken up, of course, the borns as well. So the excitement that, Eddie, uh, that Ellie brought was when she showed me the micrograph, she said, oh, Trudy, she said, it looks like they're in the lysosomes. I said, well, that makes sense because I come out of lipoprotein field. And one of the things that we know is that porphyrins associate with low-density lipoproteins. I said, well, you know what's happening. This uh, BOP material, the, the boronate of protoporphyrin, is actually binding onto or, or associating with the LDLs. And the LDL is actually drawing this into the cell. But we can test for that. And so with Dan Callahan here at the lab, we did some studies. Now, the first study up here what we did was to um, take cells, and normally you grow them in fetal bovine serum. Now, fetal bovine serum, the major lipoprotein in that is low-density lipoproteins, or LDL, which is kind of nice. And so we said, OK, what we can do is grow the cells in fetal bovine serum as usual, and then grow the cells without the fetal bovine serum. You remove all the lipoproteins from the serum. And what you see is there's a tremendous drop in uptake of the boronate compound, which suggests it's going in through the LDL receptor. And so here it just shows you twice as much boronate compound. You see more uptake in the cells. And, and again, you see this decrease if you remove the lipoproteins. So this is suggestive data that, in fact, it's the low-density lipoprotein that's doing it. And so another way to look at it is to look at LDL receptors on cells. Now, if you don't have LDL receptors on cells, you wouldn't expect the boronated compound on an LDL to be taken up. Now, there are cells available in the cell bank. Uh, there are quite a number, of course, that you can get. These are fibroblasts that have LDL receptors on them. But there are people that have defective LDL receptors. These people usually have staggeringly high LDL cholesterols in their plasma and have advanced cardiovascular disease at a very young age. So, um, so we got some of these cells. And what you see here, this is a normal fibroblast grown in the presence of the fetal bovine serum. Here it's grown in the presence of lipoprotein deficient serum. And again, you see that there's more with the whole serum there. Now, these are fibroblasts which have the defective LDL receptor. And what you see is there's very little uptake of LDL into these cells. It looks much like the lipoprotein deficient material. So that tells us then it's probably the LDL receptor is involved and that you require LDL to pull the drug into the cells. So we looked at the kinetics of the binding. And this was uh, a postdoc that we had in the lab, Lenka Malatinska, 
to assure ourselves that what we were seeing on these um, tumor cell lines, and what we're using is mostly for many of these studies, is a cell line called SF767. This is a glioblastoma cell line from, uh, from a patient, and the cell line was generated by UC San Francisco. And we looked to see whether, in fact, it had lots of LDL receptors and whether it behaved like a normal LDL receptor. And this is the 767 cell line where we did binding studies with LDL. And you see what you should normally see, that there's rapid uptake, and it saturates at one point. And then very little nonspecific binding, which is here. So you subtract the nonspecific binding from the total binding, and you get the specific binding, which is very high in these cells. So that was kind of exciting. Then we said, oh, is this just this particular cell line functioning this way, or do you find it in more uh, different uh, glioma cell lines? And so we looked at a series of glioma cell lines, which are shown here. As a matter of fact, we had seven. One of them didn't work very well. Here's our 767. We actually were able to uh, calculate the number of LDL receptors per cell. Here you get about 288,000, which is a very high number. But what is really interesting that some of these cells have tremendously huge numbers of LDL receptors, and that here's one that has 128,000 U251, which is considerably lower than some of these others. So what it tells you, and I think in real life this is an expectation, that you're going to have varying numbers of LDL receptors in a tumor cell. So this is probably not surprising. But even at 128,000 receptors per cell, that's a very decent number. And you should be able to take in drugs having that number of receptors. Because people usually say you should have at least 100,000 receptors per cell. So given this, we said, <clears throat> what we're seeing, is this a function of having this cell line and a plate, OK, showing the LDL receptor? So with Dennis Dean and John Fike over UC San Francisco, they did a xenograph of the human 251 cell line was put into a nude rat, an athomic rat, and the tumor grows within about a month's time. And then you have to take the animal and sacrifice it then because it will die if it goes much longer than that. And so we had this uh, tissue section, the brain tissue, and what you see here is this is the tumor region. What we did is we came in and we stained. We looked for the LDL receptor using an antibody to LDL receptor. This is all this brown material in through here. What is really important and interesting is that here, this area, are the normal neurons. There's very little staining. That's important because what you want to do if you're doing specific targeting is you target this receptor, the LDL receptor, and not another cell out here, which is a normal cell, because you do not want to have generalized toxicity. So that was really very good and encouraging. Then we said, OK, do we see LDL receptors in human biopsy samples? And again, with folks at UC San Francisco, John Fike, we looked at 14 biopsy samples from people that had gliobosoma multiforme. And we again looked for the LDL receptors on this material. And here you see the LDL receptor. You see this accumulation is dark material within the cells. And you don't see the edge where, where there was no tumor, but there was little of this staining in that edge where there's no tumor. But the other thing which is interesting is that only 71% of the tumors showed up with high expression to the LDL receptor. So this is where. It's important to do the sort of more personalized medicine when we get that far is that when, if you can use an LDL receptor for targeting the tumor with a drug, the first thing you would have to do is do a biopsy and actually look for that LDL receptor. And it turns out, you know, three quarters of the people are going to have, probably have those receptors, and a quarter of the people will probably have normal expression or no expression in the LDL receptor. And so those would not be good candidates using a target delivery system based on low density lipoproteins. So, but what we conclude at this point is that GBM cells are distinguished by the upregulation of the LDL receptor. And why is this observation important? 
It's because the neurons and normal brain cells have very few LDL receptors. Now, this is known from the work of other people. Peters, who worked with non-human <coughs> primates, was able to show neurons, normal neurons, have very few LDL receptors. As a matter of fact, most normal brain cells have very few LDL receptors, including glial cells. They have some, but not very many. And um, the LDL receptor, then, is potentially a molecular target for the delivery of anti-cancer agents to the tumor. And it's possible to use an LDL or a synthetic LDL to target these therapeutics to the glioblastoma multiform. So this is the direction now that we're moving in. And we have to ask the question, what about LDL as a drug delivery system? Now, I think all of you know about LDL, and everybody, I think, here probably says, oh, the bad cholesterol. Well, LDL is bad cholesterol if you have elevated levels in your plasma. It is absolutely required for bringing cholesterol to normal cells in the body for cell division and um, also for cell repair. It's needed, the cholesterol brought in by the LDL is needed for uh, membrane synthesis. And so, the, um, so you do need LDL. And the other thing which is interesting is that the cancers obviously are rapidly dividing, have to make lots of cell membranes. And there are lots of cancers in which people's plasma cholesterol actually go down. They're using those LDL, the tumors, the cancer, for growing. So the LDL receptor is probably really upregulated in a whole lot of tumors. And we know that there's, it's in prostate cancer, some forms of breast cancer, leukemic types of cancer, not just the brain cancer. So, what is the, the problem with using, though, LDL as the, the directed delivery mechanism? So, and that's one of the first things we thought about. Can you actually just take the LDL and get into the core of the particle, a lipophilic drug? <coughs> and the thing with that is that the LDL, as you remove them from the plasma, are easily oxidized, which is not good. They're difficult to isolate in large quantity, and they require a source of fresh plasma, and with that you always have the, prob the problem introducing some sort of transmission of some sort of disease you don't want. And it's also highly variable in the composition and size. So we thought, well, good idea, but maybe we can do better. And so the solution to the problem now was to design a Trojan, what we call a Trojan horse, or synthetic LDL, that can deliver the anti-tumor drugs to the tumor, to the LDL receptor. Uh, and what would happen here is if you have the drug here in this Trojan horse, the cell would, has the LDL receptor, would recognize the LDL. The drug would be protected inside the LDL, so it would go merrily into the cell, hopefully unleash all its drugs, and kill the cell. But the important thing, by doing that, targeting it, you would be sparing the neurons so that you would have no toxic drug delivery to normal cells within the brain. And that's very important. And it's one of the problems right now because <coughs> most of the drugs that we have are delivered systemically. And first of all, very little gets into the brain. But the problem is it gets into all sorts of cells. And so you wreak havoc on the cardiac muscle, the kidneys, the GI tract. So it's really bad news. And so what you need to do is get something which is targeted, get a stealth particle pulled into the cell that then releases just to the cells to the upregulated receptors, the drug that would kill those cells. So, and somebody has asked me a little while ago, well, how would you deliver an LDL to the brain? Because um, if it has a drug in it, the the brain is protected with what they call the blood-brain barrier, and that's to make sure that larger thing, entities do not, that don't belong in the brain get into the brain. But lots of small molecules can easily go in and out through that barrier. And that is a real problem, and you can circumvent it by giving somebody a drug that opens up the blood-brain barrier just for maybe 20 minutes, half hour, and to get things through. The problem with that is, if you're delivering a drug, say, based on an LDL receptor, in this case, via systemically, and then get it through the blood-brain barrier, 
There are many tissues that I mentioned before have LDL receptors, and of course your liver is a major organ with LDL receptors, and you certainly don't want to deliver a drug to the liver. So a way around that that has been devised recently is to do what's called convection enhanced delivery. And what you do in this case, when people have been diagnosed with glioblastoma multiform, the first thing they do is they do surgery to remove the mass because, because uh, it's very painful with headaches and epileptic seizures and what have you. Removing that mass is very useful. So you go in and you remove the tumor. At that time, you can implant micro catheters into that space. And then what you can hook onto these catheters is a pump which functions under pressure and deliver drugs direct, uh, directly into this space here in this cavity. And what that is, it makes it less invasive than conventional surgery or chemotherapy. And the idea is then it's under pressure, the drug that's delivered, say, on, on a synthetic LDL, a small synthetic LDL particle, would now diffuse and catch the islets of cells which were never removed by surgery. And it turns out this is being done right now, this convection-enhanced delivery is being done over at UC San Francisco with some of their therapies. So it is a real possibility. It certainly circumvents all the problems with getting um, drugs into the brain. And the other thing I guess I didn't mention is low-density lipoproteins normally are not found in the brain, nor for that matter are high-density lipoproteins found in the brain. So lipoproteins generally do not appear in the brain. But interesting, they have the LDL receptor, which would respond um, to the LDL that might be pumped into the, the brain cavity there. So more about the LDL, what, what we were thinking about when we were developing this notion of getting the synthetic nano LDL. We started with the LDL itself, which is shown here. It's a particle about 24 to 27 nanometers in size. So it's a small particle. <coughs> and in the center here, you have this lipid core, and it's mostly cholesterol ester. There is a small amount of triglyceride in here as well. Now, this droplet of lipid is really hydrophobic, so it's stabilized on its surface by, mainly by phospholipids. And then there is a protein, it's shown here, which wraps like a belt around the lipoprotein particle. Now, the LDL has a single protein wrapped around its surface, and that protein is huge. It's 540,000 molecular weight. Uh, it's over 4,500 amino acids in size, so, and it's a very sticky protein. It's a mess to work with. But it has, at the carboxy terminal end of the protein, there's a region between amino acids 3359 and 67, which has many uh, positive charge residues on it, and that recognizes the LDL receptor. So this is the ligand for the LDL receptor right in here. So this small portion of this huge protein will recognize the LDL receptor. Normally what happens with the LDL receptors are on the surface protruding off into the extracellular space, and this is kind of a schematic of what the LDL receptor looks like. And it has these um, units here, they're sort of like epidermal growth factor units, little peptide sequences, which are highly negatively charged. So the LDL comes in with its ApoB and has a region which is highly positively charged. These two interact, and that's the binding of the LDL to the receptor. Once it gets into the cell, what happens is it gets into the endosome where the pH drops. That releases now the LDL from its receptor, which is an important step. And that's shown here in this schematic where we talk about how the LDL receptor delivers cholesterol to cells and what I've had it into this, how it might deliver the drug. So here now is an LDL with the ApoB on the surface and it has drug in its core. What happens is it recognizes by the mechanism we just showed, the LDL receptor, which is associated with these clathrin pits. Those pits pinch off into the cell, and you get this coated vesicle with the LDL with the drug in it. That now becomes the endosome, where you get the drop in pH, it becomes acidified, 
And what is really nice about this now, the receptors now are released. They recycle back to the surface, which is really important, especially if you want to deliver drugs. You want something that's really competent quickly to take up more drugs. So the receptors can recycling constantly. Then, but the What's left in the endosome goes on into the lysosome, where it's broken down the constituent parts. So you get the cholesterol released, you get drug released if you have drugs there, and you have amino acids. So this is the cycle that would be happening if you directed something into the cell via the LDL receptor. And so what we did then, we said, OK, if this is going to function, we have to make this synthetic low-density lipoprotein. But how do we go about it? We already <coughs> know that the normal LDL has a single large protein on it. Not very good, because it's very hard to isolate. It's very sticky. It aggregates. It's just a mess. The other problem is you might substitute, take out some of the core lipids, substitute drug in here. It's a very painful process. Again, the particles tend to stick to one another, which is not good. So we said, OK, let's use peptide technology. Instead, devise a peptide, which would have the LDL receptor binding name, which is here in the full length particle, and get a peptide and add the domain to the peptide. And what would happen there is, because here you have one protein stabilizing a fairly large particle, if you have now many peptides, it would probably make a smaller particle, and you'd have many of these peptides surrounding one small particle. And you have the potential, and we call this the LDL nanoparticle, you have the potential of putting the drug in the core, and this is the way that we are right now directing it. We take a lipophilic drug and shove it into the core here, and now the drug in the core will be shielded by the surface, be pulled into the cell. But you could imagine that you could perhaps devise a system where you could attach the toxin to the um, to surface on the peptide portion. And there's the other possibility. You can probably use it perhaps for, for imaging, perhaps get something onto the particle. You could later on use it for imaging for tum tumors and what have you. Um, so, so we went about and we decided to, to work on this particular design here. And this is what we came up with. Now, this is actually our third peptide. There were two other configurations that did not work very well. And this one works extremely well. And so what we did is we took an 18 amino acid here, ampipathic helix. Now, this thing was called 18A. And it was devised by Nathamaya in 1985. And what he was trying to do was to mimic the helixes that make up apolipoprotein A1, which is on the surface of HDLs. And we thought, well, you know, we can use this technology. So we use this peptide here. And what is unique about it, because it's amphipathics, it has one half of the helix here has no charges on it. So it's very hydrophobic. It binds to the lipid. And then the other surface is hydrophilic, which makes uh, the particle sort of miscible with the water phase. And what you can do is you can just go to one of these companies. We use Biosynthesis Incorporated. And they'll just make you the whole peptide. And it's, it's very fast, and it's reasonably cheap to do it that way. So we have this 18 amino acid peptide. And then what we did is we took the sequence from the LDL protein itself. And this is the region here, which has high numbers of positive charges, the, the lysines and the arginines. So this is the LDL receptor binding domain here. And we attach that on to the amphipathic helix. So here we represent it as this is the helix. And stuck at this end now is this charged region, which would recognize the LDL receptor. And on our surface of our particle, the peptide here, the 18A, would stick onto the phospholipid surface and stabilize the whole particle. So the actual construction of the nano-LDL, we <coughs> sort of based it on work that Bailey had published in 2002, which we, I thought was kind of interesting. We took phospholipid and triglyceride and cholesterol ester on a 3 to 2 to 1 molar ratio, and we combined those together. 
and we sonicated the bejeebers out of it and then extruded it through a very fine pore filter, 0.03 microns. And what this does now is make a lipid microemulsion. Then we add the peptide for half an hour at room temperature, and uh, voila, what you get is a particle which is made, and the peptide avidly binds onto this particle because you recover 78% of the total peptide you put in is re recovered with those um, <coughs> lipid microemulsions. Then we ran these microemulsions through a uh, chromatography ca uh, column which would size the particles. What we did here, this was a, a fast protein liquid chromatography setup. We added, first we put through the column an HDL, so we defined where an HDL particle was. An HDL particle is around eight nanometers in diameter. And then we added in the LDL, plasma LDL, to show the boundary for the LDL. This is it here, it's about 25 nanometers. And then we looked at our particles that we generated, and we see the major part of the particles that we generate are in the region between the LDL and the HDL, and that was fine for us. We said, okay, we've made a particle which is essentially smaller than a native LDL, which we thought would be a good idea because a smaller particle would travel faster through the, the tumor mass and perhaps go further into the tumor mass in a larger particle. So this is the particle now that we used, and what we see here is electron micrograph showing that there are small round particles, an actual factor about 10 nanometers in diameter. Now, what we did with Ellie uh, is use her elegant fluorescence microscopy, and one of the early studies what we did is we labeled the peptide, or had the peptide labeled by this company, with FITC, which fluoresces green. We labeled the particles in the lipid phase with dye I, which it has a red fluorescence. We gave it to the cells, and for six hours at 37 degrees, we fixed the cells and looked at them. Here's the distribution of the peptide. Here's the distribution of the lipid. They appear to be the same, and when you merge the images, the blue here is the nucleus. You can see this yellow-orange color. That's indicative that the peptide and the lipid are going together within the cell, localizing together in the cell. Here now is a confocal microscopy where we said, okay, what happens if you look at live cells? So we did the same trick. We FITC labeled the peptide, which is here. This is the dye label lipid, which is here. You merge them, you can see they co-localize. Then we also threw into these living cells lysotracker, which will identify the lysosomes. And what you see is the lysosome correspond exactly with the peptide and the lipid, saying that you have pulled the particle into the cell and it's going exactly where you want it to go, into the lysosome. So that was a, a great finding. The other thing is to assure ourselves that we were just targeting mainly through the LDL receptor. <coughs> what we did is we used suramin, which, well, first of all, this shows uh, the cells to which we gave the, the nano LDL, which now have the, um, the stained lipid. And what we've done, it's at, one de it's at four degrees centigrade, so you just see surface binding, which is this red here. Maybe it needs a little lowering of the uh, light. But we gave these cells ceramin. Now, ceramin binds to the L, re L receptor and blocks it. And what happens if you now incubate these cells with the tagged nano LDL, you don't see it taken up in the cell, which again says it definitely is these nano LDLs are going in through the LDL receptor. And here's another way of doing it. You give the cells normal LDL loaded with the, the lipid, and um, then you challenge it with tenfold excess of the synthetic nano LDL. That also should block the receptors, and sure enough, you see this blocking of the receptors. So this tells us now for sure that we're getting um, the particles going in through the LDL receptor. Now, this shows what happens if you use a different cell line in addition to the SS767. This is 767 with about 288,000 receptors. This is the U251 with 125,000 receptors. And what you can see that there is less uptake in the cells that have fewer numbers of receptors. And that's shown better here, where we actually did use the fax machine and looked at the relative amount of fluorescence after adding 
the fluorescent labeled um, LDL to the cells. And what you see is the 767 cells have considerably more uptake of the nano LDLs than U251, which is again consistent with fewer numbers of LDL receptors in this cell line. So from this we conclude that you can construct nano LDLs using synthetic peptides, and they do bind to the LDL receptor, and they're internalized the way you expect them to be internalized. But the next question is, can the nano LDLs deliver a lethal dose of anti-cancer drugs to these gliobosomal multiform tumors? <clears throat> so what we did in this aspect was to take a drug, and what we are interested in, because we now have this lipid core in our particle, and the lipid core is triglyceride, not cholesterol ester, because when we assemble these microemulsions, we use a 3 to 2 to 1 mole ratio of phospholipid, triglyceride, and cholesterol ester. Well, we soon found you don't need the cholesterol ester, and why bother? You don't want to bring cholesterol ester into these cells anyway. Why give them more energy for membranes? So we now have done away with cholesterol ester and just triglyceride in the core. So what you're looking for in that core structure is a molecule, a drug, which will solubilize in the core. And we started out with paclitaxel, now, and, and a derivatized form of it, which was shown by Lundberg. You can derivatize paclitaxel, and it goes into uh, micro, lipid microemulsions. Now, paclitaxel is really taxol. Most of us know it as taxol, and is used uh, for many types of cancers, like breast cancer. And it is somewhat lipophilic, and people have actually tried it for gliobastoma multiform. It has not worked. Number one, you can get, not get enough of it across the blood-brain barrier, and, and it's made the people very sick, and they've had to stop using it. So um, Taxol itself has not been a very good choice of Pactotaxel for gliobastoma multiform. But what we decide to do is do this trick of derivatizing the Pactotaxel, and this was done with Andy Gibbs, who works with Tom Buttinger. And seeing here is the, pacl is the Pactotaxel molecule, the Taxol. And interesting, it looks somewhat like cholesterol, uh, cholesterol ester. The cholesterol part would be here, there's a hydroxyl group here, and you derivatize onto it an oleate chain. So now this almost looks like a cholesterol ester structure. And so with this chain, it becomes hydrophobic, really hydrophobic, and it goes into the cores of lipids. So, uh, so this is the molecule that we use to introduce <coughs> the drug into the lipid core. And we chose this paclitaxel at this point in time, as most of you probably know. It actually causes polymerization of the um, microtubules here and won't allow them to depolymerize. So if you have a dividing cell, it's pulling apart in these spindles you see here made up of the microtubules. They get locked in place. The cell cannot divide. So that's the whole principle of using the pac paclitaxel, that it prevents the cells from dividing and thus the, the tumor does not progress. So what we found was that with the paclitaxel, that we compared at first the paclitaxel to the paclitaxel oleate to see, in fact, whether we get more oleate paclitaxel encapsulated in the particles than we do paclitaxel. And you can see you get almost threefold more, fourfold more paclitaxel oleate than you do paclitaxel, so you get more bang for your buck by using this oleate form of the paclitaxel. Then the, the whole question here is if you do this, can you kill cells? And one of the first um, cell lines that we use is a tumor cell line called HeLa, and it was used actually by Lundberg, and we said, well, we better be able to reproduce what Lundberg did with his emulsion system with paclitaxel oleate. And so we took these cells, we exposed them to different levels of paclitaxel oleate, which is here, and we looked at cell survival with time. And you can see this is 24 hours, and this is 72 hours, and you do get 50% um, of the cells at, at less than 1.2 micromolar, it should be micromolar here, of drug, you see 50% death of the cells. 
Now, the interesting thing is you use paclitaxel alone without the oleate, you really don't kill the cells very effectively. You go out to very high concentration, they're just beginning to drop off. So we said, okay, we can do this with HeLa cells. Can you now do this with uh, glioblastoma multiform cell lines? And what we did is we used three cell lines here, the SS767, the U251, and the SF763, which is 950,000 receptors. And what you can see is they all respond to the presence of paclitaxel oleate, but the cell that has the most receptors on its surface is the, has the most dramatic decline in cell numbers. So what this says is that we're able to get the drug <coughs> into these tumor cells and kill the tumor cells. And the cell killing is real. This just shows what we start with. These are spindle-shaped shell, uh, cells. And in the presence of paclitaxel oleate, this is 5 micromolar, you see very few spindle-shaped cells left. And if you increase the amount of paclitaxel, they're just little bits and pieces of cells. So the drug is really and truly killing the cells. So in conclusion then, we have succeeded in creating a targeted drug delivery of nanoparticles, which are directed to the, GB, the GBM cells via the LDL receptor. And these nano-LDL particles have the capacity of delivering highly lipophilic drugs to the tumor cells. And so what we believe is that target delivery will reduce the nonspecific toxicity of cells and be very effective, uh, ultimately, in getting drugs into tumors. Now, where is this going for future directions? Um, we want to look for LDL receptors in other central nervous system tumors, because I think we're going to find it associated with other tumors as well. And we want to look for tumors in children. Very little has been done here with children. Um, use alternative receptors. We've already started to do that, get other receptors besides the LDL receptors. Potentially, you can use this with other forms of tumors, not just brain tumors. Improve the cell killing by using more toxic drugs. And then, of course, the in vivo studies that have to be done to, to show that this trick will work in an in vivo tumor that's growing in, in an animal model. And last but not least, I want to thank the numerous con uh, contributors to the project. And one I want to point out, who is right now sailing up in Alaska, Mina Nikachim. This work has been part of her PhD thesis. She's a bioengineering student here at Cal. And of course, Ellie Blakely, who just really started me on this whole thing and has been a wonderful collaborator and still continues. So thank you for your attention. So we have time for a few questions, and uh, I'll run the microphone to folks that have a question. How soon do you think that it'll be before human trials can start? Well, the first thing we have to do is to get the funding to do the animal studies. And I'd like to do those with people at UC San Francisco who have experience with it do implants either into a rat or a mouse brain, grow the human tumor there, and then do the uh, uh, convection-enhanced delivery method and into the tumor, not, not first go in surgery. You actually do it to the tumor and deliver it to the tumor and see if we can get regression of the tumor. Um, you know, if that becomes feasible and you can see there is regression of the tumor and death of the cells, um, then it takes, you know, you, you go to the FDA and you start clinical trials, and that's, you know, five years minimum. It's a long, long process. Yes? First of all, I want to say thank you for your presentation. This is more of a personal question, I guess. Um, what is the likelihood of the synthetic injections into the brain, or what are the outcomes of a patient if it, it became a patient that had that um, process done to them, having a brain tumor on any side of the brain can be damaging to other nerves in the body. What is the process that that particular drug injection would do to that person having, um, having a brain tumor, basically, yeah. is really what the question well, would be. <clears throat> I guess what you're asking is, what happens to the person that you would deliver, use convection-enhanced delivery mm -hmm. to, and, and what's the process? Uh, in actual fact, it is probably not as traumatic as we think it would be. 
you know, they, they implant catheters into children's brain for hydrocephaly, where you accumulate water on the brain, fluids on the brain. And you've already done the surgery, which is the worst part, and so you implant um, the catheters with the little pump, and, and that's sort of like what's being done with other kinds of cancers in your body. They're doing that. So I, I don't think, the, the thing which is so important is that the drug go mainly to the tumor cell, because if the drug goes anywhere else in the brain, that is a real problem. That's where the person would experience real problems, and that's what we don't want to do. You're welcome. Are there uh, any, oh, there's another question over there. Potentially very stupid question, sorry. <laughs> hey, no knowledge of biology. You, you, you mentioned that in the region of the tumor, the LDL level is higher. The body is consuming the, whatever LDL is in the plasma to, to make the reproduction of the, of the tumor. Is that what you pointed? Yeah, this, this is for, uh, say, tumors if you have some sort of leukemia, okay? The, to grow those, all those white cells that are growing willy-nilly in you, they're using the LDL for importing the cholesterol they need. But yeah. not, not for the brain. Not in the brain. And that brings up the question I thought you might be asking is, well, why do you have the LDL receptors in the brain? I, that my question was more the opposite. Can you starve a cancer by, by not having the stuff that helps the, the cells oh, reproduce? Yeah. But, but if the brain doesn't have those, maybe well, it's not right. The, the brain is a very interesting organ. It makes most of its cholesterol. And because it's a locked little box up here, and, and, and the, the question is, and I, I get this certainly from lipoprotein people, but gee, you know, you suddenly have all these LDL receptors, you know, and you don't have LDL in the brain, you know, what is happening? Well, many cells, you know, turn on, when they're cancer cells, turns on genes that have been asleep, and so now you turn on this gene, the LDL receptor. But I think functionally it has significance because the brain makes an apolipoprotein called ApoE, and people are used to that from Alzheimer's disease, okay? This protein is an apolipoprotein made in the brain. It makes a little lipoprotein, so it secretes this protein which gets phospholipid and cholesterol from the cell. And so now it circulates and transports in the brain cholesterol. Now what's interesting about ApoE, it also recognizes the LDL receptor. And so I think by upregulating the LDL receptor in the brain, that brain is getting its cholesterol because it can use these E-containing particles to, to direct it into the cell. So I, I think that's probably what's realistically happening because the brain can make cholesterol and then recirculating on ApoE e, e will go where it shouldn't go. Right. Yes. No, we have not checked into other uh, brain tumors. We're, we're hoping to do this, and I have a, uh, a student who is who's looking at LDL receptors, and with the hope, we're looking actually at the amount of message that is made for the, um, the LDL receptor. And he is, the hope is that we're going to be able to get tissues from the tissue bank at Children's Hospital for one and maybe the tissue bank at UC San Francisco and actually start looking at other types of tumors like anaplastic astrocytomas, I would guess would probably have upregulated LDL receptors, although I don't know for sure. Yeah. And a question up here. At the beginning when you were showing that um, when you take away the LDL receptors because you have a cell line, for instance, that doesn't have them, the, the uptake drops, but it only dropped to like 40%. That's what was pulling in the 40 percent? Yeah, you, you can get, uh, in those cases you get nonspecific binding. And, um, and so there is uptake through that mechanism. The nonspecific binding does not go in to the lysosomes. So it's, it's not direct traffic, if you will. So the nice thing about the receptor, it is really directed to a particular portion of the cell where the particle would be degraded. But you always have to be concerned that there's nonspecific binding. And many of the drugs that now they inject, like uh, people use liposomes, and that's take a, a phospholipid, and instead of putting lipids into the core, you have a lipid sac. It's, it's a little ball that's hollow in the center. And you either put drugs inside there, hydrophilic drugs, or you put them on the phospholipid surface, and then you inject it into the person. 
And the problem with that is that even in a cancer cell, you know, it goes in the cancer cell. It's not specific. It just binds onto a surface of the cell, and something gets into the cell. It binds onto perfectly normal cells, and some of it gets in. The other problem with that is if, if you have it delivered to a cancer cell, some cancer cells have a receptor on the surface, which is a multi-drug resistant receptor. And if people have lots of those, and I, I suspect is why some cancer therapies don't work in people, is that you, you're, you're bringing in your drug on this, on this liposome, it binds to the surface, and this um, transporter kicks the drug out of the cell. So you never get enough drug into the cell to, to kill the, the cancer cell. Good question. Hi. Uh, very quick question. Uh, you mentioned that LDL gen receptors are generally on cells that are growing. So it, my question is, is there an age relationship to, to the brain cells that may have LDL receptors? For example, can children, are children going to have LDL receptors all over their brains or versus grown people? Uh, and you know, is there a limit to uh, use of the uh, stealth methods based on age? Is there a limit to the, the use of the LDL receptor method? Yes. Based yeah. Based on age. Based on age? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't know that there's any study showing that with age you increase the LDL receptor numbers or decrease the LDL receptor numbers. And certainly in tumor cells, which are rapidly growing, I don't think you're decreasing those LDL receptor uh, numbers because I think you turn on these genes which are just upregulating everything. And unfortunately, a lot of tumors show up in older people, let's face it, so things go awry. And, uh, and I, don't, I think age is against us as far as, you know, accumulation of tumors go. Are yeah. there any other questions? We have time for one, a, two, a couple quick more. What do you suspect is happening in the 29% of the tumor cells that don't have the LDR, LDL receptors? OK. Uh, what is happening in those cells? Well, in that particular cell line, the LDL receptor has not been upregulated. Um, we haven't looked at other receptors. There are other receptors like an LRP receptor. Uh, this is an LDL-related protein receptor. It's an unfortunate title for that particular receptor, LRP. And what's really interesting is that the LRP receptor is a major receptor in brain cells, including neurons. If you don't, if, if you had a defect in L, LRP receptors, I mean, you just wouldn't develop in utero. I mean, it's that important. And so I would suspect some of these tumor cells would probably have LRP receptors, but I wouldn't know for sure. Um, it is interesting the, that you, know, you, you brought this up because when we first started, we thought, oh, we'll use the LRP receptor. And then I sat back and I thought about it, and I thought, no, that's the wrong thing to target because we'd be targeting willy-nilly throughout the brain. So uh, although there's some new, real nice peptides to use, I figured I wouldn't use that. Right. So could you uh, pick up or complete the thread about the boron? Initially, you were trying to get boron into the That's cells right. so that you could hit it with neutrons and kill right. the cell. And so then we went off in other ways of getting. Right. Well, what happened was the whole boron neutron capture therapy thing died. It just really didn't work. The, the neutron bombardment in, in the brain, you couldn't keep it small enough, the area of the brain, there was too much collateral damage. And so that is not being used. But, but it was interesting that there was this boronated porphyrin, and that got me interested, the fact that you get this porphyrin, um, which will go on to LDL, and that's why we saw it in these cell lines when Ellie showed me that picture, and we went on to do more work with it. But it, it turns out B, BNCT is, is dead in the water, that whole technology. So. That's the way science goes sometimes. Yeah. Right. This is the, the newer way, right. Uh, time for one last quick question, or if uh, any, any more questions? If not, uh, thanks again to uh, Trudy for that excellent lecture.